Driving through the backwoods of eastern Kentucky in the dead of night is the most terrifying thing I've ever done. Anyone who's ever been in the area knows exactly what I'm talking about. All the light from the moon and the stars is blocked by thick vegetation and hills. It's completely dark. There's history in those hills. A lot of history. And this energy fills the place with this crazy bad vibe. It's like the very land is mad at you. Like it wants you dead. The roads aren't well traveled. And you'll be hard pressed to see a single car driving down them at night. Cell service out there, at least for me, spotty at best, non-existent at worst. And you pray to whatever you believe in that your car doesn't break down. Knowing full well the folks who live smattered across the hills are isolated, private people. Knowing that they wouldn't be very happy seeing you wandering onto their property in the dead of night. None too happy at all. It's what my mom calls bad country. She always told me to avoid the area if I could, saying that I'd likely be murdered or worse out there. And I've heard the stories too. Stories about people getting out of their cars to help a stranded motorist, only to be ambushed, robbed, kidnapped, and or murdered. Stories about strange lights and ghost killers and vanishing hitchhikers and crazy inbred hillbilly families. There are said to be hundreds of unreported deaths out there. People just vanish off the face of the earth, never to be seen again. I've always avoided driving through those hills, but one night, I found myself driving straight down KY-52 South instead of I-75 South, straight into those hills, straight into that darkness. Around midnight, I got a message from my mom that my dad had been taken to the hospital and that his condition was serious. I immediately jumped out of bed and into my car, despite my mom telling me to wait until morning. I lived up in Richmond at the time, while my parents were down in Hazard. It's a little under a two-hour drive via I-75 South, and a little over two via KY-52 South. That night, though... I-75 was closed due to an overnight bridge reconstruction project, so I had to take KY-52. I figured nothing would happen, that it'd be a smooth yet anxiety-ridden two-hour-ish trip, but there was this dread I couldn't shake boiling up in my gut, urging me to wait until morning. But I didn't. I couldn't. I had to see my dad. I got from Richmond to Irving just fine, driving the windy road and hilly terrain with ease, going faster than the speed limit. It was from Irving to Jackson that things took a turn. First off, it was dark. Really dark. And even with my brights on, they still only barely lit up the surrounding area. The constantly curving roads didn't help either. I found myself slowing down having to navigate through the dark, around the switchbacks and turns, inclines and depressions, hoping to God that I didn't run off the road or hit an oncoming vehicle. And the dread was at the forefront of everything now. Sure, it could have been exacerbated by worry for my father, but there was something about those hills. Something evil. And I'm not ashamed to admit I was really afraid. The radio was dipping in and out, so I put in a CD to try and drown out my fear with music. But after the first song, I turned off the stereo completely and drove in silence, all of my senses on high alert. It felt wrong. It felt like I was being watched. Every so often, I would see a light flash in the woods, like a campfire but brighter. And I swear at one point between Crystal and Beattyville, there was this pale, hairless, large humanoid running after my car next to the road. I swear I saw it in the rearview mirror. It disappeared into the darkness and trees when I braked and spun around in my seat. Thirty minutes out of Beattyville, I saw a child. He was wearing a yellow shirt, blue shorts, and a red jacket with his hood up, colors that reminded me of Superman. He wasn't wearing any shoes. That bothered me. 
I turned off my brights and slowed my car to a crawl, wondering what the hell this kid, who appeared to be under 10 years old, was doing out in the middle of nowhere. I made sure my doors were locked, cracked my window, and asked him if he was okay as I rolled over to him. He didn't respond. I glanced down at my phone. No service. I asked him again if he was okay, and he looked up at me quickly, making his hood fall down. He was crying. I slowed my car to a stop and he immediately ran over, sticking dirty fingers into the cracks of my window, pounding on the door. He was screaming something about how they were hunting him, and that they were going to let the monster eat him, and they were watching us right now, waiting, just beyond the darkness. At this point, I was freaking out. And I might have even been screaming too, I just can't really remember. I tried to roll my window up while trying to not hurt the child, but he wouldn't release his grip on my window. I think he was trying to break it. A bright light flashed onto us and the kid screamed even louder. He let go of my car and began running down the road, back towards Bettyville. And I'm ashamed to say I took off. I was afraid I was going to die and become another statistic of these hills. In my rearview mirror, I watched as what looked like three men in hooded robes run out onto the road. The spotlight one of them was holding was trained onto my car and hit my mirror at an angle that blinded me, but it looked like the other two were going after the kid. I blinked and looked back towards the road, speeding like a bat out of hell. I pulled off in Jackson and drove straight to the police station. Two detectives and an FBI agent who happened to be in the town working with a liaison listened to me with grave faces. When I was finished, the agent thanked me and then told me that a kid in town had gone missing the day before from a Bible camp near the Kentucky River. He said that's why he's in town in the first place. Apparently. The kid and his friends were out playing hide-and-seek in the woods in broad daylight when he just disappeared. He was wearing yellow, blue, and red, like Superman. The strange thing is, his footsteps just stopped, and his shoes were still there. It was like he was lifted off the ground by air. It was weird. Half a dozen cop cars with twice as many cops, the agent, and a search and rescue team were dispatched to the area within minutes of me reporting what I had seen. I drove to a local diner and ended up staying at Jackson until morning, making the 40-ish minute drive to Hazard after the sun rose. After hearing why it took me so long to get down there, my mom was beside herself with worry, but was also glad I was safe. My father ended up making a full recovery. If you're wondering if I do feel like a coward, if I regret not letting that kid get into my car, the answer is a resounding yes. I do. I am. It haunts me to this day. But I don't know what would have happened if I stayed there any longer. And I don't know if either of us would have made it out alive. No trace of that kid was ever found again.